Thank you, Wendy, for that beautiful rendition. And um, thank you to everybody else that uh, participated in the program today. Um, the sermon uh, for today is titled, When God Calls You Out of Your Comfort Zone. And um, I wish I would have had more time to uh, dive in deeper into this because it's, 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 um, it had been going through, through my head for quite some time, um, especially as, um, as I went on the recruitment trip of student missionaries. But I think uh, this message right here applies to each and one of us when God calls you out of your comfort zone. So this right here is a picture uh, of me and my, my family. And uh, take a guess which one is me. No, that's not me. That's my sister. You're all messed up. <laughs> I'm... I'm I'm not the one in the middle. I'm the youngest one, the, the, the baby, baby one right there. And um, here's where the debates are like, uh, you know, my daughters, do they look? I should put one of you, Anna, but my daughters look just like me. <laughs> Anyways, so this right here, this picture with my family, it is interesting because I share with them an article this week. On it's called T C K um, Third Cultural Kids Third Cultural Kids, and I, I was trying to start a conversation with them on 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 how our lives had been changed and affected by having so many times to move as a family. I remember uh, way too many times. Um, by the way, our, our, our Chukis brothers and sisters are going to um, another event, but you're also welcome to join us too if you want to. Um, some, um, that's why they finish a little, a little earlier. Um, but right here uh, with this picture, you know, I remember, do you see what kind of car is the one in the back right there? Volkswagen, they were super famous. I remember so many trips in this particular van um, and, and packing it all the way up because, you know, uh, we would move from country to country on that thing. And sometimes that thing will be pulling a trailer where we will pack all of our stuff in there, even our dog. I remember, I don't know why... Why was it this way? She was a boxer, but instead of going with us in the in the in the van, she will go in the trailer, and it had a little tarp, and um, we'll pull it, and she'll stick her head. Are we there yet? Uh, poor thing. Yes, definitely not the American way of treating pets, but um, we move quite a bit. I was born in the country of Paraguay, but if I go to Paraguay, they're going to be like, mm, who are you? You're not Paraguayan. And if I go to any country that I went to, the, they eventually will find out that I really don't belong to any of them. I mean, from Paraguay, we moved to Argentina, the sky blue one and um, lived there for three to four years. And then from Argentina, we moved to Peru. And we lived there for four years. And then we moved to the U.S. But all these trips and doing all these things, I often wonder, man, this is really crazy. Like our family just poof, uprooted and it has to go somewhere else. To some people, I remember talking to, especially pastor's kids, I remember talking to them. And to them, many of their experiences were in the negative way. But for me, it had always been a positive. I loved it. I love moving. 
I love having to know that I was going to make some new friends. And as I had the conversation on that WhatsApp group with my family, I was like, what do you think made the difference? Because my brother and my sister, they all had positive experiences with the whole moving from place to place. Why is it that we're not like other ones that are feeling like, ugh? According to my mom, she says, well, to us, it, it, if the parents are excited, then the kids will be excited. So it can be like a domino effect. That's what I think it is. We don't know for sure, but I'm glad that my parents decided to stand up and go every time God called them to do so. So we're going to be looking at the story of Abraham, Abraham, before he became Abraham. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Amen. If you're there. All right, good. We are going to be looking at this whole chapter right here. Well, just jump into a few of the Bible verses to highlight. But we read in verse 1, and it says, The Lord has said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will what? I will show you, is, show you, is this an easy task? Is God asking something? You know, this is so complicated because right now we're thinking like, like Guamanians, Chamorros, or Americans, or Chukis, or, or, or Kenyans. We're thinking, oh, okay, I'm just going to get up and move, but I'm still going to be, you know, on WhatsApp and on Skype call. <laughs> Some of you may remember that. Or I still got email or Facebook to see the pictures. No, this was a pretty harsh command. This was pretty high up there because it's, it, it is very well known that at that time, if you were to leave your parents, that was going to be it. That was going to be the last time you were going to see them. Your cousins, your aunts, your... This was like, get up, go, and where I'm taking you, you're not going to see your family anymore. Your country, what you like to eat, you're not going to taste it no more. <laughs> Get used to where, where you're going is going to be very different. This was no easy task. Not like today. And you may say, well, well even today, Pastor, is not easy. Well, even more back then is what I'm trying to say right here. But God says, go because I will show you. And so, just so you can have an idea, once again, I know I've done this before, but so you can zoom in as to where Israel is. Now we zoom in, right, and we get to that little map right there. I, would, I remember as a kid seeing the back of the map and not having any idea where that was in the world. You understand now, right? We zoom in. That's where we're at. So, Abraham... Well, Abram at that time, then his name changed. Started right there on the right side. And then it went all around until finally got to that land, which was called the promised land. Now, it wasn't like in today's age that as you travel, you know, things are easy. You just get on a plane and you watch a movie as you are flying across the world and you just, or sleep, or read a wonderful book. No, no, no. This was carrying everything. And just imagine carrying everything by foot and just like, <sighs> Because it wasn't like at that time the roads were made everywhere, like in the time of the Israelites or later on where, the, where Israel became the middle or the bridge to the whole world. No, no, no. At this particular time, it was full of rocks and things and, and, and trees. It, it wasn't your, your typical trip that they were going to make. 
And now, instead of living among the related and highly civilized people, he will be going to tribes of materially lower culture and an especially degraded religion. I mean, we could debate as to what culture is better or whatever. That's not the point here. But there was a very high contrast between both sides of this particular world. Right here, that section of the map, you know, you will always kind of see that people make a living or a town around what? There's something very key for you to survive. Water. And when you have two rivers that surround you, it is pretty, this is pretty good land. So that's why it was civilized, it was bigger, you know, that's the site also, you know, where Babylonia was built. Um, so anyways, this was not the first time that God has spoken to Abram. According to Acts chapter 7 verse 2, it says, to this, he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father, Abraham, while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. So once again, he appeared even from before Haran, so he was already there. So that's how, so you can know a little bit of the context. Now we go to verse 2. Amen, if you're still awake. We're, we're digging in. We're digging in, okay? Don't, don't, don't snooze off. I will make you into a great nation. And I will what? Bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. So now God is telling him this is what's going to come as a result of you stepping in faith as to where I'm telling you to go. This is pretty big because God is telling him, I will bless you, and in turn, you're going to be a blessing. See, church, get this part right here. When you accept God's call into your life, you will be a blessing to the people around you. You carry a blessing when you step in the purpose that God has called you to. So there's three things, three uh, things that we see when God is showing up to men, command, promise, and blessing. Say it with me. Command, promise, and blessing. Three things right there. But the first one is where we have the problem. All right, verse 3, we continue with the story. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. So God is here, right, right here saying, as, I, as you step into the calling that I've given you, I will watch over you. I will protect you. Don't be afraid. I'm watching over you. So turn to the person next to you and tell them, don't be afraid. And then the Bible verse continues, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Once again, when you step into God's calling, you become a blessing on all the people around you. Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. How is it that Abraham ended up blessing everybody? Well, right there is the answer. Verse 8, a scripture foresaw that God will justify the Gentiles by what? So because Abraham stepped in faith, today you and me are blessed. Did you get that? That's how much of a blessing Abraham stepping out in faith ended up being a blessing towards us. This is, this is pretty big. It's a domino effect on the following generations. This is what I often try to tell people. Like, you become a blessing for others and even in your family tree. All nations will be blessed through you. Then we continue. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham 
was 75 years old when he set out for, from Haran. How old was he? 75. Turn to the person next to you and tell them you're not too old to step in God's purpose. You're not too old. Abraham was 75. And, and this is the beautiful part of this Bible text right here. It is that Abraham just went. You know, it doesn't say that Abraham said, well, what about my parents? You know, my parents, uh, you know, this is going to be the last. Well, what about uh, mm, the job that I have here? Well, uh, Abraham didn't say, mm, you know what, God, can you make sure, please, that it's going to rain for three days consecutive. Then I'm going to know, you know, that I can step in faith over here. The Bible just tells you that he went. He did it. He stepped forward. At the age of 75, you see too many times you want a guarantee. Well, if I have a guarantee, then I'm going to go. But that's not how God works. God works as I want you to go. And in the step, it, it, see, too many times we are concentrating on the destination where you're getting when God says the blessing is in the journey because I will teach you to trust in me. So it is based on trust. Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Here's another teaching moment from his story. And that is, wherever you go, praise God. Worship him. Don't be ashamed. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I feel guilty about this. Because whenever I have a conversation with random people, they, they often ask, what do you do? And many times I've, I felt like, <sighs> I don't know. It could be that sometimes, you know, I'm like embarrassed or, you know, why is it that I'm embarrassed? And I've tried to do some digging. It could be that the stereotype of, of pastors, right? Oh, so you live of people's money. Ah, so it's just with tithe, huh? So you're like, you must be rich and all this. And then I don't, obviously there's no room to explain. Look, in the Adventist church, pastors are, are they pretty much make the same thing as teachers. It, it, you study a career too. It's not that, oh, okay, this brother can preach, so let's put him as a pastor. You know, um, things don't work like that in the Adventist church. You go to school college and you 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 have a degree but you don't go into that but obviously as soon as you say pastor it's like hmm all these and I can see sometimes the eyes kind of like I are you embarrassed or do you sometimes refrain yourself from saying that you're a Christian some of you can avoid it really well if it doesn't come out in the conversation, what do you do? Well, I'm an engineer. Oh, okay. You then say uh, you work for the church. You then say uh, Adventist World Radio too. You know, you have to ponder upon these things. Do you share your faith with others? Are you unafraid to just say, I am a Christian. I love my Jesus. And this is what he's done for me and in my life. You know, I usually wish I could do that, but usually the, the question of what do you do comes really right at the beginning. And then too many times I see the walls just rise up real quick. But Abram, whatever he went, as you read his story, he is building altars to the Lord. At the same time, witnessing to the people as he's making this trip, this is the God that I follow. This is the God who took me out of my land and is taking me to the promised land. 
people were able to observe. Verse 10. Now let's go to verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Wait a minute. I just read to you verse 7, and now we're in verse what? Verse 10. So this is, this is pretty fresh. As Abram is arriving to the promised land, the story tells you that there is a famine. <laughs> Do you get it? Abram could have been like, what in the world? You are taking me in this whole, I mean, I don't know if it took months, probably a lot of months, maybe a year, maybe two years to get to this destination. And when they get to their destination, there is a famine. God, didn't you tell me that you will be with me? That I'm going to be a blessing? And here I am. And then now, boom, famine. Because when God calls you, he doesn't promise that it's going to be smooth. I love this quote right here that says, if the mountain was smooth, you couldn't climb it. You need the rocks in order to climb. You need the rocks in order to grow. It is through the challenges in the journey that you're growing and you're experiencing to trust in God. So here's the first test for Abram and his family, right, with the famine. And it was so severe that they went to Egypt. So I also like this other quote. It says, the Holy Spirit is most active in your life when you are out of your comfort zone. I mean, I've seen this with uh, Americans. They step out of beautiful land of America and they go outside and then suddenly they're out of their comfort zone and they start seeing different things. I mean, why do you think short-term missions are so successful? Because constantly they're stepping out of their comfort zone. Um, anyways, growth begins at the end of your comfort zone. Church, are you growing? Are you growing? Verse 13, we continue with the story, and it says, Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Just because you are a faithful follower of God like Abraham doesn't mean that you may have a chance where you where you just trip and fall. This is Abraham, the father of, of faith. And he's having a big hiccup. Uh, can you say you're my sister because you're too beautiful? Now, I don't know how she looked, but I tell you this. You know, the, the Bible text right here says... Uh, Verse 14, when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very, what, beautiful woman. I mean, we can go into this tangent. I did actually go into this tangent. I'm sorry. Uh, probably not that relevant. But I, 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 w I do wish, I really do wish that women could get this part right here. I read one book on self-esteem one time. It was a Christian author, and he said the following. I wish if there was a superpower, something that I could give to the whole world world, what I would do is give a good amount of self-esteem to women. And this doesn't mean that men don't struggle with self-esteem. There are some, some men that do struggle with self-esteem, but I see this problem being faced most by women. And I kind of have to agree with him on, on this thing. The Bible says right here that she was a beautiful woman. According to whose standards? You have to think about this. I, 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 as I was looking into this, I was like, every woman is beautiful. Probably you were just wrong in the wrong age. If you think you're ugly or whatever, right? Once again, I don't, 
this is going to be uh, very short. But women in Egy Egyptian art are often depicted slim, high waist, and narrow hips. Dark black hair, possibly even with a bluish thing, and golden or bright skin for women were considered ideal. Women also wore long braided wigs. Men and women in Egypt routinely shaved their hair and wore the wigs instead. If you go to ancient Greece, they will bleach the curls. You know, they would do the curls and then bleach the ones in front. And it was really cool to have a unibra. If you didn't have a unibra, what would they do? Yes, they will paint it so they could have the full unibra. It, do you get it? Like, who established that uh, unibras uh, are cool? And then who established uh, unibras are not cool anymore? Shave your eyebrows. Make it this particular shape or that. You, you see how beauty can change? Look at all, this other one. Uh, in medieval Japan, uh, they would shave their eyebrows, and then they will draw the eyebrows like higher up into their forehead. So it wouldn't be here, but it would be way higher. I don't know how that looked, but I'm pretty sure it was weird in, in our standards today. But I'm pretty sure if we were to travel back then, they would be like, you guys are even more weird than we are. Renaissance in Italy, big foreheads were a big thing. And so many times they will shave part of their foreheads so they could pull the hair even more back so they could look like they have a really big forehead. Yes, some of you, you were bullied probably because of your forehead. If you were born in this time, they would be like, wow, you are the most beautiful thing. You know, and also it said at this time, if you had a rounded stomach, it was a great thing because it meant you could actually deliver many babies. And so to them, it's like you had a, a, a little round belly. They were like, yes. Interesting, right? Also, uh, um, um, women of this, this time as well bleached their hair and plucked their hairlines to get this look. Anyways, uh, 18th century uh, France, if you had a, what, what do you call this? Uh, double chin. Yes, if you had a double chin, it was like, wow, you're so beautiful. That one thing that some of you have been trying to get rid of so bad, hey, if you were in France, that was perfect. An oval face was prized, and so a slight double chin and dimple. Ro rosy cheeks, women wore their hair long and curly. <sighs> but because of that, Abraham stumbled upon his faith and up, up to what God had called him to do and told her to lie, and at the same time, he was lying too. A lack of faith in the father of faith. I love this story because it, it, it tells us that he was human too. Even though he was stepping in a moment without fear, I'm going to go forward. I'm going to move forward. Even though he was moving by faith, he was still challenged with his conflicts. But today's message for you from his story says, are you wanting to grow? Then if you want to grow, you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. That's why the quote, growth begins at the end of your comfort zone. I mean, what are you afraid of? Of the unknown? Well, you should be more afraid of stagnation and just being there like a swamp. That's why it's a dead pond or whatever. It's because it's not moving. There's no water that is flowing. Growth involves risk. If you're not risking, you're not growing. I love this illustration, and I'm going to be finishing with this. Um, eagle. Well, eaglet, it's a baby eagle. And the baby eagle, whenever, whenever um, they start getting of a certain particular age, what the mother eagle does is starts to take the feathers out of the nest. And so things are poking when you start removing all the, all the feathers. 
So then the little eaglet feels so uncomfortable right there in the nest. It's not as comfortable as it was when it was born. That is forced to jump off and fly. What if God has been trying to do that in your life? Removing the feathers so that you can finally take his calling. And you may say, well, what if it doesn't work out? You know, what if, what if I step forward in God's calling and it just doesn't go the way that I thought it would? Well, it didn't for Abram. There was a famine. But now looking at the whole scope and the whole picture, you saw that his sacrifice was worth it. The stepping out of his comfort zone was worth every penny. Some of you have to let go of friends that are holding you back. Some of you have to let go of addictions that are holding you back into the purpose that God has called you to. Some of you have to let go of family. And some of you also have to let go of self-pity as to, ah, oh, well, I was wrong in the wrong family. I just, you know, I was handed some really bad hand at, at birth. I was born in the wrong country. I was born this and that. I'm the wrong color. I'm the wrong, you know, uh, uh, height. I'm the wrong this or that. Cut it with that. God says, if you believe in me, if you step into the calling that I've given you, I will do mighty things. You will be blessed and you will be a blessing to others. So can you step into his calling? Well, pastor, I, I don't know my calling. I don't. I don't know. I don't even know where he's calling me to go. I don't even know if. Pray. Fast. Seek him. Seek him. God is not a God that is like acting hide and seek. It's like you don't have because you don't ask. Well, why are you going to ask me if you already have your whole life figured out? I try to tell that to young people. Once you get baptized, it's not what you want. It's what God wants for your life. You know, you may say, well, I want to be an engineer or I want to be a teacher. And God has other plans for your life. But that's the beautiful thing from the story of Abraham. When you step into God's calling, into his purpose that he has, it is such an effect. It is so magnified that you can't even understand how big it is. It transcends who you are. It goes into family trees and generations to come. So step in God's calling. And if you don't know God's calling, figure it out with him on your knees. Asking, Lord, please reveal what do you want me to do? And it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter if you say, well, uh, that's a message for young people. Wrong. Once again, the story of Abram shows you that even at 75, God can give you a big calling that would make an impact on the world. So if you want to say today, I want to step on God's calling. Can you raise your hand real quick? I want to pray for you. Leave it up as I pray. Dear God, I, I thank you for your church. I, you have a calling for each and one of us. There are things that are holding us back. I want to step forward, Lord. I want to step full-blown blast into your calling. 
just so that there is no doubt whatsoever that you are the author of the calling. I pray for each and one of the people listening to this message with their hand up right now saying, Lord, please, I want your calling and I want to step in that purpose that you've given me. Please, Father, be loud and clear. Let us all know the things we need to let go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Right now, uh, we're very happy and uh, that you came to worship with us with Agate Santa Rita SDA Church. May the Lord keep you and bless you. If you want to join us for potluck, the time will be now at the cafeteria. <laughs>